Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Discovery Showcase stage, Dr. Bobby Brooke Herrera, Assistant Professor of Global Health at Rutgers University. Good afternoon, everybody. We're switching gears a little bit. Um, we live in an era where new viruses often dominate the headlines. But today I want to tell you about a virus likely you've never heard of. And it's not just a story about a virus, but about how silence, inattention, and inequity allow potentially preventable suffering to continue year after year. My name is Bobby Brook Herrera. I'm an assistant professor here at Rutgers. And this story is a story we cannot afford to ignore any longer. It was a warm July evening in Ohio. A seven-year-old boy named Jacob was chasing fireflies barefoot, laughing under the twilight sky. That night, he developed a fever. By morning, he couldn't speak. By the time he reached the hospital, he was seizing his brain under attack. Doctors scrambled for answers, but none of them suspected what was really to blame. Most people have never heard of La Crosse virus, but it is the leading cause of pediatric encephalitis in the United States, the leading cause of brain inflammation in our children, quietly infecting hundreds every year. How is it possible that something so devastating remains virtually invisible. La Crosse virus strikes in places that we in the Northeast rarely think about. Typically, it strikes in the rural Midwest or in the Appalachian Hills, as depicted by um, the red states shown here. It is spread by a common mosquito, often lurking in the backyards where children's play in these regions. In kids, especially those under 16 years of age, the virus can be brutal. Seizures, swelling, lifelong brain damage, and behavioral changes. And it returns every summer like clockwork, unspoken and unchallenged. What makes La Crosse virus so dangerous isn't just the infection itself, it's the delay because early symptoms, including fever, headache, confusion, look like dozens of other illnesses. With proper testing, however, doctors, with proper testing, doctors miss the window when intervention could actually save a child's life. And the virus keeps moving silently, neuron by neuron. I'm a virologist. I study viruses that most people and most funders ignore. When I learned about La Crosse virus, I realized it was and it was and I realized it was attacking children here in the United States every summer with almost no public awareness. I couldn't turn away. There was no rapid test, no vaccine, no outcry, just families like Jacobs with left with heartbreak and questions no one could answer. My lab has been working on diagnostic test development for a long time. Long before the COVID-19 pandemic, I was developing and rolling out diagnostic tests for other types of mosquito-borne viruses, those that typically affect the global south. However, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we built a new kind of system called AmpliFast, which uses enzymes and virus-specific primers to amplify nucleic acids at a single ambient temperature. Think of it like a lab-based PCR test, but without the need for expensive equipment or a fancy lab. The diagnosis is then made on a traditional rapid test strip. So I'm going to play a short video that demonstrates how this technology works. Unlike conventional multi-step methods, AmpliFast is a simple ambient temperature system that utilizes proprietary enzymes to amplify large nucleic acids in less than 20 minutes at better or equivalent levels as PCR. A group of enzymes react with pre-designed oligonucleotide primers 
which help them find and bind to the complementary target nucleic acid in an individual sample. Then, a final enzyme creates new copies of the nucleic acid by incorporating complementary nucleotides. The reaction occurs exponentially, amplifying the sample to detectable levels. Amplifast empowers at-home and point-of-care tests across all industries, from diagnostics to agriculture. So using this technology, we built something, the world's first rapid molecular diagnostic test for La Crosse virus. Think of it like the common COVID-19 rapid test, but for La Crosse virus. It works under 30 minutes. It doesn't require a fancy hospital. It can potentially be run in a rural clinic or a school's nurse's office, even in places where healthcare is often an afterthought. To validate the test, we turn to one of the most powerful tools used in the biosciences, mouse models. Mice are an essential bridge in biomedical research, allowing us to model infection, immunity, and disease progression in ways that simply aren't possible in humans. So what we did is we infected young mice, which we call weanlings, and adult mice with La Crosse virus. And we used the rapid test that we developed to track the viral dissemination into the brain. And what we found was very interesting. In young mice, shown at the top, um, virus, La Crosse virus, trafficked into the brain at four DPI, or four days post-infection. However, in adult mice, shown in the tests on the bottom, the virus trafficked into the brain a whole day later, at five days post-infection. This suggested that adults were able to control the infection better, which likely explains why they have better outcomes. This observation made in the laboratory opened the door to everything else that has followed. Traditional lab-based or PCR-based testing can take days to obtain a result. But when a child's brain is swelling, we don't have days. We have hours or maybe minutes. Our test bridges that deadly gap. It's not just about diagnostics, it's about time. And with severe viral infections, time is life, time is everything. Of course, detection is powerful, but it is still reactionary. And so then the question is, what if we could limit the infection severity or prevent the infection from occurring entirely? What if we could build a shield before the mosquito bite, before the fever, before the seizures? That's why we didn't stop at diagnostic test development. We engineered a vaccine based on our studies using the animal models. This is my last data slide, so stick with me. In the lab, we have an incredible ability to track specific types of immune responses after viral infections, down to individual cell types and cell populations that fight viruses. That's exactly what we did in these experiments, and in particular, the experiment shown on your far left. We infected again adult and young animals with La Crosse virus and measured their virus-specific cellular response, an essential part of the immune system that helps fight viral inf infections. What we found was striking. Adult mice, shown in green, are capable of generating strong virus-specific cellular responses as compared to young animals shown in white. So we next asked, could we engineer a vaccine that induces an adult-like immune response, but in young animals? So what we did again is we vaccinated our young animals and then challenged them with the cross with another group which remained unvaccinated. After infection, we monitored for survival and the results were dramatic. As you can see in this middle graph, vaccinated mice shown in pink had significantly improved survival as compared 
to their unvaccinated counterparts, all of which died at seven days post-infection. And on the far right, we see that vaccination didn't just help improve survival, it actually and actively limited the amount of virus that could traffic to the brain, thereby extending life. So in this graph on the far right, our unvaccinated animals shown by the white bar graph have much more lacrosse virus in their brain as compared to the vaccinated animals shown by the pink circles. So in our mouse models, the results were clear and breathtaking. Most vaccinated animals survive the lacrosse virus challenge, whereas 100% of the unvaccinated mice did not. The vaccine limited viral spread into the brain. This is more than just a scientific milestone. It's a proof of concept that we can provide protection to the brain from within and not just treat damage after it's already been done. This didn't happen in a billion dollar pharmaceutical company. It happened in an academic lab here at Rutgers with a small team of passionate scientists, students with a shared mission in improving the health of our friends and neighbors, both here in the United States, but also abroad. Lacrosse virus, like many viruses and diseases, strikes the forgotten corners, small towns, rural clinics, families that work the land but rarely make the news. There are no celebrity telethons, no billion dollar vaccine races, no lobbyists pushing Congress for funding. These are children of the working class, the rural poor, the families who are told implicitly and explicitly that their suffering doesn't command attention. This isn't just scientific failure, it's moral failure. It's a question of who we believe is worth saving. To me, science is about discovery. It's about justice. Real justice means we don't wait for Wall Street or Washington to tell us which lives matter. It means using every tool, including diagnostics, vaccines, etc., to serve the invisible. We live in an age where scientific progress is under attack, defunded, denied, and doubted, but we cannot afford the luxury of apathy, not when a child's brain is on the line. Imagine a future where every pediatrician, even in the remote parts of a country, has a rapid test for a dangerous viral infection and actually knows how to use it, Imagine a world where kids are vaccinated before mosquito season, not after hospital admissions rise. Where prevention isn't a privilege, prevention isn't, um, isn't, pre isn't reserved for the wealthy, it is a right guaranteed for every child. That future is within reach, but only if we fight for it. What if Jacob had been vaccinated? What if his doctor had known what to look for and had a rapid test in hand. These aren't just what ifs. Every delay in funding, every denial of a vaccine's value, every budget cut to public or global health, they are choices and they are choices that have consequences measured in hospitals, beds, in seizures and in silence. So lacrosse virus and many other infectious diseases are potentially preventable, but only if we choose to act. We have the tools, we have the science. What we need now is the courage to stand against indifference and against denial. Because if we can protect one child, if we can save even one laugh, one dream, one life, then isn't it worth everything? Thank you.